So I would say both, right? Like, the, on one hand, I would like people to be engaged and interesting, right? Like, do something with these systems, both with the technology as well as with the cells, and hopefully you get excited, and then you learn something and you realize something about how these cells behave in various contexts, but also how the technology, how the technology works, right? And really giving people a window. I mean, this is not really, this is not really microscopic, right? Because you can see it with your, with your naked eye. I also th still think it makes an interesting addition that you realize that these million individual cells actually bring something forward that uh, the individual cell does not do, right? Which has many repercussions if you think about your own body, which consists of many, many cells, like, like your, your skin or something, right? Like how do phenomena on small scale tr translate into emergent behaviors in a much larger scale? And I mean, many of these things that we do right now is, is much more on developing a technology that is stable enough and that allows us to interact. And we're only now coming to this thing that these things are stable, then we can try different interaction modes and then sort out what does really work, right? What does maybe for different user groups, age groups, different learning goals, right? Um, I had a question. Yeah. Um, a couple slides ago, you had a table of the teacher's perceptions and one mm -hmm. of them was going backwards or waste of time or something. Sure. Mm -hmm. How did, like, that, that would be my fear as a teacher, that the interaction would make my kids distracted and, and not have them learn and instead have them just think about the light. So did you get, did the teachers talk about that at all or did you observe anything that the kids were doing that they marked as not productive or counterproductive? So, so this particular question to the teacher was basically like, I mean, we, we showed them the whole setup demo to them and then give them a question and saying like for, for your very personal teaching what would you find useful and really want to use and what do you actually think you would not want to use because you personally think it would not work well for your lectures right and so some teachers said they use certain types of games in their classroom like very limited at the beginning or at the end just to loosen up to kind of get more engagement things like those right um, some pe teachers said they don't do that right and I mean, I ultimately think uh, good education comes from synergy of many different media that you can choose from and that you kind of use in, in the right way. And there are also different kids that, that learn differently. Right? Um, okay. okay, so now everything, so far everything was hands-on. Now the question is, could we actually um, provide this kind of interactive experience somehow over the web? Right? Could you log on to a website and then do biology experiments there? Which would have many advantages in the sense that it would um, allow children at home to do experiments. It would uh, allow a teacher not to hassle with all the uh, biological logistics. I um, also want to point out that I still think that hands-on experience is important, right? But any sort of online uh, experiments can have significant advantages as well. And so we set out uh, to build uh, um, a setup that uh, could really scale up and have many students do simple biology experiments uh, uh, online. And what you see here is, is uh, basically a very simple website. Again, it works with the same organism that is Euglena. You have a big screen where you, um, it's the view, the camera view into the microscope. Then you have a joystick here from which you can control these four LEDs that are again on these four sides. And then you have the external view uh, onto the microscope where you can actually see how these LEDs uh, light up. And so it's important for a student to have this external view as well to kind of um, get some relationship of, of what they're actually doing. And if you follow the movie for a while, then what you see is you turn on light, which is also kind of indicated here by this bar, and then the cells, cells all start moving. You realize not all the cells move exactly the same. Some don't respond, but overall there's responses. And you have a real, um, real-time feedback of kind of playfully exploring um, what, what's going on here. And the primarily learning goal would be phototaxis, right, like cells move away from light, but you can discover uh, much more, right, because movie data, image data is, is very rich. Um, <clears throat> and so the basic setup is, um, again, pretty similar to the one before where we have these four LEDs, a simple microscope um, that is then hooked, hooked up to the web, and some Arduino, um, some server and computer that kind of control um, everything. Right. And so we did now a number of studies, and that's where Paolo Blixstein comes in. So he's a professor at uh, Stanford in the School of Education. Um, and so, for example, we did one study in, in San Francisco where we had uh, 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 50 students at different days, um, all, all with the same teacher. And the idea being that the students within uh, one hour 
could do a simple experiment, could analyze the data, and then do some modeling uh, on, on top of that. Um, so this is actually pretty tough, especially if you, time-wise, especially if you really want to do pre- and post-tests also for learning research. So the way we set it up, had some pre-tests, and students did experiments, and analyzed and, and modeled the data, and so I'll come to this in a second. So first, uh, in terms of experimentation, so if we have um, students individually run their experiments, which we first tried, did not work so well due to bandwidth uh, limitations um, in the school themselves. Um, and so there's another mode that we then tested is where basically the whole class did the experiment together, which was projected big on the screen, and one student would uh, kind of uh, take the joystick, and everyone was looking, and students were discussing and suggesting uh, what, to, what to test next. In the second activity, students then took their data and uh, could uh, basically look through it um, uh, with a simple movie replay. We also had some augmentation, some um, image analysis, which kind of in a single image already tells you in which directions all the cells move. And then a student could make uh, simple inferences like count how many cells are really oriented to the light, how much are not, is it really responding to the light, is it going to uh, and away from the light. And then the third one is, uh, the attempt to allow students to model, and this comes again to the question like how can you, um, how can you really bring this modeling into, into a school environment, especially in biology, which is not used as much in an educational setting and really in, in a very compromised uh, time. And what we did here is uh, that we have an animation of this little box that you can see here, which has all the correct mathematics for the 3D motion. And uh, in the background, you basically see real movie playing. Um, there's a purple trace of one of these cells. And the idea is for the students to find the right parameter set of this model um, to make the cells fit um, that behavior. And so there are three parameters here, the speed, um, how fast it rotates around its own axis, and uh, how strongly it responds to light. And so students can basically choose parameter, let it run, change parameters again, and never get some sort of an intuitive sense of how this model uh, actually uh, behaves. And so, again, we really need to make something that students could do within 10, 15 minutes and really got, got something uh, out of that. And so, and but the post has uh, revealed that students certainly learned the content, so that's very, very good. So, for example, they uh, could answer that cells respond to light, that are for the taxes, and, and all these kind of things. The other important feature was that students felt um, that at agency, that this was really a meaningful experience for them, that they enjoyed and, and that they uh, liked doing. And we also got uh, very positive uh, feedback from the teacher who said that this was like a really, uh, a really good uh, experience um, that the students liked and that uh, really enriched um, um, the classroom. Um, so, and then we did another um, uh, uh, collaboration with uh, Kami Yona. So, he's in Northwestern University and he has. Um, uh, cloud lab system called iLabs where he basically allows students from all over the world to do experiments uh, online. But so far he had mostly done uh, physics experiments. For example, students could log on to a Geiger counter, right? And um, uh, he also has a different mode of experimentation, not kind of the live one where you have this real-time feedback, but rather you program an experiment like you say, I want to have this light on for so and so long, this light on for so and so long, then you submit this. The experiment gets executed, and then five minutes later, you have your data back, right? And so he ran some studies. Um, so basically, we integrated our Euglena uh, system with, uh, uh, with this iLab. We created some lesson plans. And then he had a number of teachers in local schools uh, basically run through it. And we also got uh, very positive uh, uh, experiences uh, from them and, and positive feedback, actually, from the teachers. Um, and the general notion also from the teachers is that if you have something live, like cells, that students seem to even respond generally better to that than something physics-y, which is rather innate. So, but this is something that really needs to be explored uh, further. Right? So what's the future of all of this? Where does it uh, lead us to? So here you see basically the setup. So we have multiple of those. And uh, if you really want to think about scaling, you I mean, we basically developed a, a setup with a central server with these individual units. We have the users on the other end, and then the user comes in and is basically routed to the next available, available machine, um, being able to run the experiments and then getting the data back. Um, it's also very important um, for any sort of kind of cloud lab systems or any server system, you need to have some sort of a framework that monitors whether everything is in order. You have the standard one for the electronic components, but then you have an additional feature here. Um, due to the fact that we um, work with living organisms, the organisms may not be perfect in every any of the setups. And so we developed an auto monitoring framework where in each of these, these microscopes, um, we do real-time tracking of the cells, 
counter cells, how many are there, and from time to time, even turn the light on and see whether they're all responding. And you can see, for example, right, like here on these two setups, there are enough cells, and this one, there's not. And so what this would mean, then, if a student logs on, the student would not be routed to this particular machine, um, so to have a meaningful experience. And we, on the other hand, who maintain the server, would get a message and saying, like, here needs to be some, some checkup, right? And so this is really kind of an additional layer needed to have something that really runs stable uh, from the outside and, and always provides a good, uh, good user experience. And if you think about uh, how this scales in terms of cost and uh, user number, um, a simple setup like this is pretty similar to the, to the phone that I showed you earlier. You can build for about $250 with, with everything, including the webcam Raspberry Pi to run it and so forth. Um, so you have this, you can build a setup for $250 and um, if you really build it uh, in scale. And if you then think about it, if an experiment takes about a minute, um, you can run about half a million experiments a year. This of course means you would have to run it 24 seven, but this is possible if people from all over the world are using it day and night. And if you think of, of like that, that uh, about five million students in the US every year go to kind of similar biology lesson plan, right? In particular age grade. Um, you can really see that with not too many of these systems, you can really gear to, to a very large number of, of students in a very effective yeah. manner. An individual experiment would be less than uh, a cent actually per experiment. Should we turn this off? Or? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. What you were doing, the three you mentioned there, and I, I happen to know more about okay. your other work. So Thank I you. was wondering about the robotics labs. This one costs 250 but your robotics labs for um, the pipette cost like $500. And are those affordable? Are those like reasonable costs, include, like including all of the things they need, to, the students need to do? So, so I come to, to this other one in, in like two minutes maybe. Um, so here the thing is really this particular setup that we have here is really geared to like how can you make it as simple and as cheap as possible, as inexpensive, right? Um, I mean, that's why also like our earlier system, of course, did not use a Raspberry Pi, but we really now built a thing such, how can we really do it with minimal components that are cheap and are also very easy to assemble so that even other people could kind of build their own cloud labs, right? Um, so, and just, just want to say, right, so far we always talked about, okay, there's these four LEDs with, with this Euglena. You can do other uh, experiments. So online we could integrate the projector a system that I told you earlier. And we can also use other organisms. So what you see here, for example, are Euglena, and then this is Volvox. It's a multicellular um, microorganism. It's like a big ball. And it actually has uh, positive phototaxis. So if you shine light on, you see the Euglena move in one direction, a Volvox moves in the other direction. You also see some hydrodynamics going on that kind of swirls the Euglena around. And so we can really think of later going beyond just Euglena in this a very simple setup, but really using different stimuli, different organisms, and really branch out the content on, on such a biology uh, cloud lab, right? Um, so maybe let's go to this one quickly. So the, um, we built another system that uh, we had earlier, uh, which uses uh, Fusarum uh, in, in Petri dishes. So this is much more macroscopic and actually also on a much slower time scale. So what you see is the Petri dish is about this size, there's a robot which we prototyped out of Lego um, that pipettes food. So what you see in red here is where food is dropped and in yellow is this organism. And so you see at the start of it, the organism is here, then the organism finds the food and then basically follows uh, the line of food, right? So you can have an interactive experience. Now the thing here is actually it takes an image every 10 minutes and uh, the whole time course here is about a day. So it's a very, very different time scale and also length scale of, of the experiment itself. The way this works is that the student logs on makes part of the trail and comes back a couple of hours later and, and see how, the, how, it's, how it's going, right? Um, and uh, so here's uh, what the system looks like. So you can go online, uh, choose your experiment, and um, go into the particular experiment and the way you program it is essentially you draw um, a path um, where the food should be dropped and then the system in the back end, so, and these are kind of uh, robots made out of Lego Mindstorms, that uh, then actuate and, and uh, put the fluids at, at the at particular positions. And the imaging is actually done by a conventional scanner and you see multiple uh, petri dishes here, right? Um, so you can do multiple experiments in parallel and then these images get pushed to the database and then students can look, and, and look at that, right? 
Um, so here's the setup. This is a pipette made out of Lego. So it only needs a standard syringe. Every, syringe. Everything else is, is Lego. And we built a server rack with three such machines, which really was also important to understand kind of the infrastructure um, from a, a systems point of view. Oops, yeah, this is actually what this uh, slide here is. If you have multiple machines and each machine can run multiple experiments, how do you really coordinate uh, all of that, right? And it's actually a different, uh, different architecture to, than the Euglena one because with Euglena you always had one student at a certain time really checking out a particular system, controlling this in real time, while in this system each of these uh, machines work autonomously, uh, gather um, uh, information from many uh, uh, users, execute them, and then uh, putting it back. So this is kind of uh, two different uh, architectures um, that are suited for different types of uh, interactions and, and machinery. And just want to say, I mean, this of course is, is education and it's kind of low throughput machines, but in the biotech space we now have like increasingly more complex machines that can run thousands of experiments in parallel, and which then gets to the point if you kind of hook these type of machines up, allowing other students or real researchers to really do experiments uh, uh, online with similar setups uh, like that, right? So I used this in, in, in a theory class at Stanford, so student did experiments, they also did, did modeling uh, um, with that. And so I already mentioned um, kind of the more professional um, uh, scale-up uh, prospects of that. So there are a number of uh, companies out there now, emerging cloud labs, that offer services to researchers, to pharma, and so forth um, for doing experiments online. And um, the protocol in many of these cases is still like you fill out some sort of a form, you submit, and then there's a mix of machinery and people at the back end uh, doing the experiments for you, but the systems move more and more to complete automation, and also that you actually can even completely um, program the, the, the robots themselves. You can basically have a, have a scripting language for, for, your, for your experimentation. Um, and so we, we partnered up with uh, Transcriptics, with one of these companies, and uh, asked them to have a simple thing that we could run with the class, um, so I did that. Um, where the experiment was rather simple. It was basically like, let's look at bacterial growth curves where bacteria start growing and student initially could um, determine how much antibiotics would be put in and then see how, how is the growth. And here you see uh, one student result. So the solid lines are basically experiments then the dashed lines is kind of a model that a student made. And you can see that with different uh, levels of, um, of antibiotics, basically the growth is delayed and also flattens out earlier, as you would expect, right? But it's kind of a different way now really tagging into commercial systems of um, doing experiments online and then uh, lining them up with, with education. And as I said, like, these companies are just at the beginning. Um, they will certainly uh, get better and cheaper, more versatile and so forth. Also want to say there's a very different space between kind of targeting pharma or real research and education, because with education you're happy if a million children do a very simple experiment where we do where we know the outcome, that's kind of the target. But with pharma or other things, you have a very small user base that want to have very versatile, very perfect, more expensive experiments, right? And so they're kind of two very different routes to go here, but maybe there's synergy um, uh, between them, right? 